welcome everybody to the fourth session of the spring series. Uh, the session was entitled From Quantum Bench to Bedside. And as you know, what we're trying to do is, is to give some insight to the downstream of upstream primary science. And in my mind, the downstream is, is the approach towards realistic therapeutic interventions that may be used and derived from some of the, some of the science that we're looking at, combined with perhaps science from elsewhere. Uh, our speakers today are, are Greg Scholes, Lisa Herbert, and Brent Vaughan. And I'm not going to introduce them any further because uh, Margaret Ahmed, who is uh, at Sorbonne, is going to make our introductions. Today we are in for another, another real treat in this um, amazing lecture series. And today our three speakers, Lise Hebert, uh, Greg Scholz, and Brent Vaughan, will talk to us about new ways to use light, sound, and electricity for therapeutic purposes. So um, to introduce this session, I'll talk about a, unif about a unifying uh, thread that seems to be running through all, all of these approaches, and that is the notion of coupled oscillators in biological systems. And if you look at this photograph, this is actually an image of hundreds of thousands of fireflies all luminescing together, which illustrates this principle because every single firefly has its own frequency of emitting luminescence. But when they're in a crowd, they look right and left at their neighbors and then they adjust their frequency so that they are all luminescing together in synchrony. And this is a very common thread in biological systems. You see this in neurons, in crickets chirping, in heart pacemakers. And I couldn't resist taking an example from down under, given that Greg is apparently from Oz, which illustrates the power of this force. Synchrony between oscillators in a kangaroo is achieved because each leg, hind leg, has a frequency which is then coupled together to give synchrony. And obviously the synchrony is what provides the maximal use of force in the biological response, which in this case is a hop. So lest you think this is simple, actually most systems are highly complex. There are hundreds, if not thousands of different oscillations going on. And even if they all start at the same time over time, you quickly get into a random system known as decoherence. Sorry, I'm just gonna go real fast here. But the, the, um, the important point, which I think all of the speakers are gonna make use of to some extent is that if you can find forces that speed up the slowest frequencies and slow down the fastest frequencies, these so-called coupling forces can make it such that you can achieve coherence even in the most complex type of oscillating systems. And of course, in quantum physical terms, this, this, is, um, this concept is known as, this, as quantum coherence. And we're talking in this case of electron spins. So physical systems like mitochondria and, uh, and uh, chloroplasts, photosynthesis, photosynthesis and mitochondrial electron transfer can also be looked as highly complex um, quantum oscillators, which are coupled through these uh, spin chemical processes. And this quantum coherence can be driven by both light and or magnetic field effects. So finally, to bring us to the, the topic of the speakers, I think we are now going to learn about how these quantum coupling forces can modify the rates of reactions of medical, biomedical significance and lead to novel medical applications through light and electromagnetic fields. So our first speaker today will be Lise Hebert, who is a um, sorry, senior vice president at Clocks Technologies. She's founding member, she has 10 patents, and she has an impressive former resume, including former vice president of Neurochem Inc., former executive director of the Quebec Federation of the Alzheimer Societies, and past president of the Quebec Association of Nonprofit Organizations. Um, she will be talking to us today about innovative use of fluorescence biomodulation, so light, 
therapy in regenerative medicine. And specifically, she will talk about Lumi Heal, which is a procedure for wound healing. She'll talk about its discovery, the scientific background, commercialization, regulatory uh, approval. And I, I have actually Googled uh, Dr. Hibert and found many, many examples of her. You know, she's lectured all over the world, has many, many collaborations. But I draw your attention to this one in Montpellier, which caught my attention and makes me want, wonder whether, as part of her research, she's also investigating the medicinal properties of other types of um, drugs and chemicals. So our second speaker will be Professor Greg Scholes, who is William S. Todd Professor and Department Chair at Princeton University. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society in London. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, former University of Toronto D.J. Leroy Distinguished Professor, Editor-in-Chief of J. Phys Chem Letters, and co-director of a, a number of organizations which have investigated the use of bioenergy and, and photosynthesis as an energy source. He's best known for quantum coherence phenomenon in photosynthesis. And today he will be talking to us about, um, in a more general sense, about biologically coherent systems. Now, just to give you some more details about Professor Scholes, um, his interest in coherence is actually not just limited to the workplace, where he calculates things like coupling constants for co complex oscillators. He also looks at coherent phenomena by, in his spare time, ordering jumbles of components from Radio Shack and uh, putting them all together to make beautifully coherent 1980s era cassette decks. For example, this Nakamichi dragon. So a truly all-rounded coherence constructor. And finally, I come to um, Frank Vaughn, who is seen here hard at work contemplating the wave nature of the physical universe. So this Brent Vaughan is CEO of Cognito Therapeutics. This is a company which is leading uh, in the clinical application of optogenetic advances. It has achieved FDA breakthrough designation in the treatment of Alzheimer's. It has achieved clinical programs in Alzheimer's, MCI, and Parkinson's disease. And Brent has, in addition, extensive experience in this field with over 20 years in drug and device development, where he has been CEO and co-founder of Cognoa, which also achieved FDA breakthrough status and first FDA cleared AI-based diagnostics for autism and was also co-founder of Wellness, Wellness FX. So um, today he's going to talk to us about specifically his role and, and the uh, latest developments in Cognito Therapeutics. And this is a company which is using light uh, electricity, sorry, I'm sorry, Brent, I meant electricity and sound in the treatment of Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative conditions and to achieve structural and functional changes of therapeutic benefits in patients. So now I hand it over to the three speakers for an exciting session. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here today. And Margaret, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. So today um, I will be uh, speaking to you about uh, clocks technologies um, and, and really, uh, and more specifically, it's a proprietary regenerative medicine platform, which is based on a form of uh, photobiomodulation, which we call fluorescent light energy. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, exactly related to the topic of today, we have completed multiple clinical studies uh, and proof of concept work, and I will be presenting uh, those results to you today. Uh, fluorescence 
historically uh, is known, it's been used uh, within diagnostic tools. However, uh, to the best of our knowledge, Clocks is the only company utilize, utilizing um, FLE as a therapeutic. And, and we think this is uh, very unique. Its mode of action um, is based on modulating uh, the mitochondrial physiology. Um, and uh, at this point, we are approved uh, in several geographies uh, with early commercial adoption in Europe, in Australia, and our recent approval uh, has been in the US uh, for Lumihil and also in China as recently as December 2021. Uh, our lead programs are uh, Clereska for moderate to severe acne vulgaris, Lumihil for chronic and post-operative applications, and we also have uh, a pipeline into other conditions in uh, dermatology, wound care, oral health, select rare diseases, and aesthetics injectables. So I will be giving you today an overview of the uh, commercial uh, activities uh, that we have undertaken and the FLE systems which are on the market. I will be presenting to you our understanding on the mechanism of action and the modulating activity that FLE has demonstrated on the healing cascade. And uh, with uh, Greg, um, you know, uh, I, Greg will be presenting um, how the future research uh, focus uh, will, will be undertaken. So um, this, is, this is what the pipeline is looking and with our partners uh, listed on the right, uh, you know, we are actively co commercializing uh, these products. Clereska, our brand for moderate to severe acne vulgaris, Lumihil, but also for Rosacea, as you will see, Lumihil for both acute and chronic wounds, including post-operative surgical and burns, and then Fovia uh, for Pyoderma in collaboration uh, with Vitoprinol uh, based in France. This is an outlook of the pipeline, as I mentioned before. So moving into the various indications, so Clereska right now is, you can see its approval status. So it is approved and marketed for acne, for skin rejuvenation, and also for rosacea with early programs um, in, uh, in development. We aimed at supporting our programs with medical and scientific evidence. So we have a few examples here of uh, the publications that uh, have been accepted. And, and this is what the, the, the NFLE system uh, is composed of. Here you have the uh, multi-LED uh, activator, which emits blue light. And then you have uh, the Clereska topical, which is an amorphous gel, uh, which is used and applied uh, to treat uh, the face, the hands, the chest, and, and the back as well. This is the consumable, um, and, and this is what the physicians need uh, to purchase. The activity uh, of, of our systems is, has been demonstrated uh, at multiple levels, um, and uh, in moderate or moderate to severe patients, when compared to competitors, their activity is, is very good, and even when combined with uh, such product as isotretinoin, uh, provide a, a, a wide range of uh, efficacious uh, uh, outcomes, which are really important for the patients and can really distinguish Clereska from its competitors. Just to give you a taste, uh, this is a patient uh, from being treated uh, you know, in the market, this is uh, her at baseline. We treat the patients for six weeks, twice a week for uh, just a few minutes. We stop treatment after six weeks. And this is her after 45 weeks without any further um, uh, you know, um, intervention, medical uh, intervention. So, so our systems, and that's a very important feature, are associated with long-term durability. The same in this gentleman, this is him at baseline with severe acne, 
and him after 58 weeks being treated only again for six weeks. And here you see in the back. So in, in one care, uh, our lead brand is Lumiheal um, and it's being uh, commercialized right now for hard to heal wounds. Um, and has just been approved, uh, it is approved in Europe, for example, for hard to heal wounds, for post-surgical applications, for burns. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned uh, in the United States, just recently for post-surgical applications. Uh, this is a program which is also well supported uh, by um, scientific literature um, and, and something that uh, we, we take a great yeah, we, we value certainly to support uh, the safety and uh, efficacy, effectiveness of, of our systems. This is uh, to present to you uh, the FLE uh, topical and LED light activator in the case of Lumihil. Uh, we have an hospital-based uh, multi-LED uh, activator and also a portable one. And we have uh, various formats uh, either as the uh, amorphous hydrogel or a Lumihil matrix. Lumihil uh, has been shown in a clinical study to be highly efficacious in hard to heal chronic wounds. Um, the mean age at entry was already 36 months without being responsive to other treatments. And in the case of this Eureka study, we showed that 82% of the wounds responded to treatment uh, Lumihil was able to accelerate healing uh, very efficiently. And what is also, the, it statistically sig and significantly improved the quality of life. Um, and, and very interestingly, it was associated with a very low rate uh, of uh, clinical signs of infection and infection. And, and a very low rate of wound breakdown, um, which uh, similar to Cleresca, speaks to the long-term durability of the clinical benefits that the FLE systems uh, can convey. Uh, so here you have an example of a hard to heal wound, a 10 year old unresponsive to standard of care and already within two months, uh, you know, the Lumihil was able to uh, kickstart the healing process and, and um, lead to uh, wound closure. Um, here is another uh, great example in the case of a slit thickness skin graft and Lumihil. Uh, here, uh, Lumihil is being used pre and post graft. Um, and um, you can see the very smooth skin and, and the, the great uh, wound closure that Lumihil was able to uh, bring to the, to the surgery. So, so fluorescent light energy is a new form of uh, photobiomodulation. And what we have shown is that um, it can modulate the mitochondria and, and is really the, the best example uh, to, and, and to, to, and the one that relates the best to uh, photosynthesis, for example. And we know that uh, the electron transport chain uh, can be sensitive uh, to light energy. And, and I will show to you that FLE is very efficient at modulating uh, the mitochondria being uh, its mechanism of action. So here um, to, to explain to you what is an FLE system. So this is a depiction of the multi-LED activator emitting blue light. Imagine that this is the skin of, an, uh, of, a, of a wound. You would apply uh, the amorphous gel with the chromophores inside uh, on the surface of the wound. The illumination is only five minutes, so there is no pre-incubation -incub required here. And instantaneously uh, will create the um, release of fluorescence in the various depths of the skin and as such, within those five minutes, within all of those layers of the skin, will stimulate the endogenous uh, photoacceptors of the skin to promote healing. Uh, endogenous photoacceptors are uh, a well-known um, 
uh, elements. Uh, the, the eye is certainly uh, well documented in, in that respect. And the skin is not different, uh, ranging from heme, from flavins, and many elements of the electron transport chains. All of these molecules can, can respond to light and, and uh, assist in um, modulating uh, cascades uh, in bio of biological systems. So we have shown uh, that um, the FLE platform can, uh, in fact, uh, influence favorably the three phases of healing. The inflammatory phase, where wounds uh, very often uh, will be stalled into a chronic inflammatory process. We can also favorably modulate proliferation and cell modernization and growth so that uh, full wound closure um, is achievable. Now, here's the data on the um, mitochondria. So this is a model of uh, within an animal, um, which uh, th those animals were suffering from chronically inflamed and infected cells. And uh, FLE was used as an adjunct to antibiotics uh, over a period uh, of uh, several weeks. And um, on the next slide, you will see, but in, in tandem with uh, improvement of the clinical outcome at the four week time point, we saw uh, an increase in the size and number of mitochondria uh, with a lot of uh, well, well visible uh, inner cristae and the reshaping of the organelle from circular to tubular. And, and that phenomenon occurred as the clinical benefit was recorded. That is uh, the, the, the animals' uh, paws that were infected and inflamed were healing. And as this was taking place, uh, we saw the great change in morphology uh, of the mitochondria. Um, from the, we had taken biopsies, that's how we could uh, evaluate the, the mitochondria status. But at the same time, in respect to inflammation uh, and the various um, uh, cascades that need to be stimulated for healing to occur, uh, we saw that several markers such as factor eight, epidermal growth factor, all important into the healing process were statistically and significantly increased at the four week time point here in the blue bar, whereas the TNF alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokines was significantly decreased at that time. So um, a, a real good and interesting set of results showing that, um, you know, as inflammation um, is, is better controlled, healing is taking place. Um, the platform received in 2019 an innovation award uh, at the Targeting Mitochondria Congress for its results, showing that um, using human, human dermal fibroblasts in a distress model, meaning to say that they were exposed to pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, the FLE gel or the FLE uh, matrix were able to uh, restore homeostasis with an hyperfusion uh, um, fusion uh, phenomenon, as opposed to the fission that we could see in the distress inflamed cells with the mitochondria very much uh, around the nucleus, um, you know, in, 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 um, in mode for apoptosis. So this is the data per se. Uh, where we show that um, already, so here eliminating the cells for five minutes with the FLE uh, and those cells being distressed, uh, already after 30 minutes, we show that uh, there is a mean decrease in uh, the mitochondria number and the beginning of the increase in the volume of the mitochondria, which uh, became confirmed at 24 hours post-treatment where the trend that we had seen at 30 minutes uh, became statistically significant at 24 hours. Again, uh, a testament to the fact that uh, we were able to restore the cells from the inflamed state to uh, the, the healthy normal state. We also investigated if this phenomena would be associated with increased energy production uh, by the mitochondria so here we use an ex vivo full thickness skin organ uh, biopsy uh, environment 
And we showed that again, um, you know, if cells were exposed to the FLE uh, for the five minutes, uh, as, as we do when we treat uh, uh, humans, we can see that already after six hours, there is an expression in the ATP uh, expression, which translates at 24 hours in an increased secretion in the, multi in the culture media of the uh, ATP. So here, um, you know, I think, um, again, uh, exposing the human dermal fibroblast to another set of pro-inflammatory cytokines and then treating it with FLE, uh, either Lumihil, Cleresca, or the Lumihil matrix, you can see the migration of the fin phenotype from the uh, very evident um, uh, fission uh, that, uh, of the mitochondria around the nucleus, migrating to the hyperfusion uh, phenotype, which really uh, you know, is, is, is linked to the restoration of the mitochondrial network. So this mechanism of action um, is at the base root of, of, um, of the FLE systems. I have mentioned uh, that um, these systems can influence every phase of healing, and here's uh, the data in, in that regard. So first inflammation, which is the first phase, um, it is very important uh, to limit the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which uh, can lead to the stalling of, of the healing and for the wounds to become chronic, for example. And here in vitro, we showed that we can significantly in human dermal fibroblasts after FLE exposure for five minutes, decrease the uh, production of the IL-6 and TNF-alpha, which are two pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, and that's, um, and, and if we do a time course to analyze uh, uh, the uh, modulation of this, you can see that uh, very rapidly, uh, the IL-6 will decrease to then return back to normal as, as the cells heal. Now, this, what is very interesting is that um, we used filters, circular filters and linear filters at the output uh, between the gel and the cells to see if the whole FLE spectrum within the visible range of, of the spectrum uh, was required or not to be able to modulate, for example, the decrease in IL-6 uh, production. And that's exactly uh, the result uh, that we were able to document. So if you were to apply uh, the circular filters to the plane activator emitting its blue light versus uh, the filters in front between the gel being illuminated and the cells, um, if the whole spectrum uh, was not available uh, to the cells, the decreased production of IL-6 was abrogated, which speaks to the uh, importance of the full spectrum to get uh, the, the this modulation that we have been observing. In the case of angiogenesis, we also saw that uh, a one-time treatment of FLE uh, can increase the number of tubes, can increase the number of branching points, and can also increase significantly uh, the production of, um, of uh, collagen, always better than plain LED alone. And here we speak about lamp uh, activator alone. Proliferation and collagen, uh, another important part of the uh, healing cascade. Here, patients suffering from pressure ulcers with grade two and grade three uh, ulcers with biopsies taken at various time points, that is 15 days and 30 days. Here, patients were treated twice a week. We saw a significant increase alongside healing in real key important uh, markers of proliferation. Um, and, and being TGF beta 1 and VGF. It is important to stimulate the production of collagen, but it's also important to 
properly stimulate its remodeling to have an aesthetically uh, pleasant uh, clinical outcome. So um, collagen in normal skin will have a basket weave type of organization as opposed to hypertrophic scars with, which will have more aligned collagen fibers. This is exactly um, what the Lumiheal membrane and gel were able to induce. That is the basket weave type of organization of the collagen, which um, translated into the patients that we treated into uh, very smooth skin um, and, and when the wounds were closing. So we have shown uh, the same uh, impact on, on remodeling in, in various, uh, um, and, and here, um, Yes, uh, the FLE induced accelerated wound area regression in the acute wound model. So this experiment is actually key. Um, so one of the question for this presentation today is um, how this, how did Lumihill get approved in the United States? And, and FLE was unknown, unknown to the FDA. So we agreed with them uh, that uh, we would treat uh, acute wounds, incisional wounds with Lumihil, but in contact or no contact. And, and what we were able to demonstrate is that whether the gel and, and, and being eliminated was in contact or not induced the same healing. Um, so that was um, the demonstration that the FDA required uh, that contact was not required for the primary mode of action of FLE, which led to the confirmation of the device designation of Lumihil, uh, leading to the de novo approval in December 2021. So it is a pure photonic um, out, out, outlay uh, that really heals the wounds, uh, and that's the demonstration that was required for the FDA. So. With, with this presentation, what, what we have shown is that, um, you know, there is long-term persistence when using FLE uh, in, in patients today. Uh, we know that it leads, leads to a favorable uh, tissue response in respect to the healing cascade, involves cell-to-cell -cell interaction where we have shown specifically uh, the modulation of markers really important into healing um, speaking to the signaling cascades uh, that uh, can be modulated, and all of this uh, being perceived by the mitochondria uh, to be able to uh, modulate uh, and, and restore uh, the uh, phenotype and the dynamics uh, of, of the mitochondria towards a healing uh, phenotype. What we also know um, is that a five-minute uh, exposure to FLE using two-dimensional ultraweak photon emission imaging translated into a 13-hour metabolic activity. So you see it uh, sustainable over a 13 hours period, which leads to, to our next slide, that is, what does happen um, in, in the first moments when the photonic energy in the form of fluorescence, FLE, um, impacts uh, the cells um, and, and, and kickstarts, uh, you know, a cascade of reactions uh, that, that will lead to healing. And this is my segue into uh, Greg's presentation, and I thank you for uh, which, and, and Greg will speak about the future uh, research focus um, in that regard. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do here um, is try to promote some discussion, I guess, and, and taking a very high level view of um, what, uh, how to think about what this, what the light might be activating and 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 what the parameters are that would come into play here in general without having to worry about um, details, you know, the many levels of details actually that go on in the cell to promote healing. And 
So as Margaret hinted at the introduction, this is something to do with synchronization. So I'm going to just hypothesize this general principle and then look at um, what the ingredients specifically would be in this and you know, maybe other phenomena. <clears throat> so firstly, if you um, think about what wound healing or any complicated biological process is, is um, many um, there's, there's, there's in many intertwined and interdependent networks that are all going to um, cycle through to make the process happen, including um, uh, both molecular events and also macroscopic effects like migration of cells and so on. Um, but it's not a stochastic process. We know that there's got to be some order to this as there is with almost all biology. Um, so if it's a collective effect, then it makes sense to think about some kind of framework, um, a more abstract framework we could use um, that would provide a, a way of thinking about the process and a way of thinking about how perturbations to it might um, reset the needle, if you like, when, when these networks have gone haywire. <clears throat> that would be the bottom line here. So synchronization, we're all familiar with synchronization, um, especially in terms of uh, visual images of it, flocks of birds, pedestrians, um, and herd migrations, and so on and so forth. Um, the models that we would use for these phenomena, um, and I'll give you a sense also of you know, how wide ranging this is, um, in terms of what it can be applied to uh, are incredibly simple, but seem to be powerful and work in all of these cases. And the ingredients that you need are just three. So you need a picture of what the network is. So whether that's just the positions of the birds, the starlings here on the left would be the nodes in the network, each bird. <clears throat> um, We'd want the natural frequency of those nodes. So how fast um, would each bird fly, for instance, in this case, in what direction? So it would be a vector for them um, without the input from the other birds, their natural frequency. And then there's going to be some coupling. Coupling is usually a feedback system where, um, as Margaret said, the, for the fireflies here, the birds would see each other and make course corrections, speed corrections, and so on to stay with the, with the flock. <clears throat> so these are the ingredients and you can put them in mathematical terms as frequencies and couplings according to the structure of the network. In other words, the positions of the birds in this case. And what, what is interesting about this is that if the coupling, if the feedback between the birds, for instance, isn't strong enough compared with the natural speeds that they want to fly at, um, then that flock of birds will just naturally disperse if you start it as a flock of birds, or it will never form if you don't start it as a flock of birds. And, and what that would look like if we project this onto how we would normally map out phases of oscillators, so sine waves, it'll look like the, the um, what you can, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the the sine waves in the left part of the bottom right plot, there's a lot of directions there, that are just sitting randomly on top of each other, okay? They're not organized. Whereas on the right side of that plot, you see the sine waves are all synchronized, they're organized. So the plot on the left of the phases um, shows that they're not organized. And if we start an unorganized network with sufficient feedback loops or coupling, and remember, this could be the birds, but this could also be by bio, um, biochemical reaction networks. Um, and what you watch with time, the phases synchronize, take some time, some periods, you go back and forth, back and forth, and eventually um, you can synchronize. So this could be, in this case, you've got the flock of birds, it could be um, cycles, of biochemical reactions of any complexity, all of a sudden going um, in the right order. You want to make one molecule, which is used in a second reaction, which produces something in a third reaction. It has to happen in sequence. 
or the process is going to break down. The other aspect of this synchronization um, or what we might observe when we study it is it's an emergent phenomenon. So, and, and that goes back to the fact that there's these thresholds for the, the whole thing working. If the coupling or the feedback is too small, nothing is going to lock into sync. If it's big enough, it will. A good example is this um, people walking on the Millennium Bridge in London. <clears throat> um, if there's you know, a normal number of pedestrians on the bridge, um, nothing exciting happens. But when there's a critical density of people, you know that you're, if you're in a crowd, so you don't bump into everybody, people tend to walk in lockstep. <clears throat> and just the small vibrations of everybody's footwork comes together here if it's synchronized and that whole bridge swayed. And so it gives you a sense then that you make something much bigger than the parts. And this is the idea of an emergent phenomena and there's a threshold for that. <clears throat> and I'll give a biological example of a threshold, it's well known probably to most of you, which is used by this squid um, as, a, uh, as a means of protecting itself at, a defense mechanism called counter-illumination. What the squid wants to do is glow um, for a certain number of five hours or something it is, I think, I can't remember, um, during the day at a particular time. And it to do that, it recruits these bacteria that, um, that glow. But what it needs to do, we need a clock on the glowing. So it needs to turn on and off. Um, and the turning off is simply that the squid ejects the bacteria from its gut or from this organ where the glowing happens. The threshold, but, but what's interesting and what's the network here in particular is what, what turns on the glowing. I can summarize here um, from the point of view of the bacteria which can emit light. Um, if we just have individual cells, it, it, it never emits the light, it never glows. And, you know, it's, it's biologically costly to emit that light. And if a single cell does it or just a dilute solution, it, it, there's no use to this light. We can't really see it. But at a critical density of the bacteria, there's enough of them that if they all emit light, it, it's pretty bright and we can see it. So there's a threshold number of bacteria um, at which they start to glow. So this is a turn on, which of course is a collective phenomenon. It's like quorum sensing, <clears throat> and it's it's um, it, it's all to do with signals sent between the cells and received, and when there's sufficient concentration of these signaling molecules, the function turns on. So it gives you a sense that this is this is an oscillator. This can, it is exactly an oscillator. Um, another one, okay, maybe this is a bit obscure, but which, which is the locus that um, uh, you might have seen or heard about that march through. Um, Africa and eat everything in their wake. Well, this only happens at a critical density and this has been documented. So when there's not enough of the locusts, they just wander around in any direction at a critical density, they march as a pack. And that's when um, they eat everything in their wake. There's mathematical models also for this. You know, this and trying to give the sense that, that these threshold phenomena and collective phenomena where once we pass the threshold we have something new is the point uh, uh, everywhere so here's a mathematical model proposed or proven i guess actually in the 1960s uh, by erdos and renyi very famous very simple to explain um that um that can guide your thinking about this threshold and what and how to visualize it. So <clears throat> the idea is that uh, the dots on, you can see on the left here, these are the nodes in the network, but you can think of them if you like as just little dots that you throw down on the table in front of you. And then you're given a bunch of connectors, so edges for the graph, and you can randomly place them down. So a small number of edges. Uh, will connect some of the dots. And what you'll find, it doesn't really change things much. It connects two of the dots, maybe three of the dots, until some threshold where when we add another handful of the edges completely randomly, somehow um, 
and this is a theorem, this is not numerical or not, you know, dependent on anything else at this threshold, which is a little bit less than that, where the edges are in number a little bit less than the number of vertices I've laid down there. We add a few more edges and it connects all the little groups of them, all the little trees and forms essentially one giant graph. Okay, right at that threshold, there's, a, there's a, 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 just a few extra vertices unconnected. They very quickly merge into the network. So in other words, we go from the individuals on the left very, very quickly with just adding a handful of edges is unbelievable effect actually to a single unified connected network. So what I'll finish with is just, okay, well, there are these collective phenomena and so on, but how would we think about, I can't read everything I've written here, to be honest, it's blocked by the pictures, but how do we think about the ingredients in the oscillator model, maybe more relevant to the wound he healing? As I said, every biological circuit is a node, okay? It has a clock, um, so some kind of cycle. So anything that's periodic in any way in time, um, which most of biology is, or where there's a, we, there's a sequence, things happening in order. This, this says there has to be a clock. Um, these are the nodes of the circuit. Um, so we have a bunch of nodes. They could be cells. They could be um, a bi biochemical circuits within the cells or this whole hierarchy of such. They could be individual bacteria, it could be circuits in the bacteria and the interplay with the cells, but each is characterized by a rhythm um, of its circuit and that's the frequency. So that's what goes into the model. I said one of the three ingredients is the frequency. The other is then the connectivity and typically in complex systems, everything is connected to everything else. This is the usual, this is like in the Erdos Renyi graphs and also like in this original mathematical model I showed you. Um, uh, and so this is this is the coupling then. The coupling um, is a can be a mechanism like quorum sensing, giving out reagents that we can detect, any any kind of feedback loop, okay, which you can imagine. And there's many, many ways of doing this. It doesn't have to be a physical. Um, connection of a physical oscillator, I guess is the point I want to make. And it, and once we make, so once we've made the abstract model a little bit more concrete like this, we can say, well, what determines the synchronization? So if we, if we think that a, in Lisa's presentation, if a non-healing wound um, has unsynchronized response of the cells, so they can't coordinate um, to make, to, 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 to um, become powerful enough to heal the wound. You know, what's going on? What, what could be a change that we could make to reach the threshold where we can synchronize and become healthy again? Well, the things to play with would be the coupling between the nodes so that the feedback control loops, the frequency spread of the nodes, which would be, um, if, if the intrinsic clocks of the biochemical processes in all the cells are too different in frequency from one another because of something going wrong, <clears throat> this is going to make it impossible to synchronize because we don't have enough of the coupling between them. And possibly it could be the initial phases, but usually this is not the case. So in other words, it doesn't matter if everyone starts completely out of phase in their cycles, they will get into phase. Um, so the idea, so thinking back to what this fluorescence from the gel might be doing, um, it's, it's, some, it's somehow affecting probably either the coupling between the nodes, re resetting or starting some kind of um, process um, that turns on the coupling or makes the coupling more robust or stronger. Um, or there's something going wrong with a large fraction of the cells. So the frequencies of their, <clears throat> their cycles is all messed up and it resets those frequencies, narrows the distribution, and then they can be synchronized. <clears throat> so the main idea for discussion then is can light initiate 
some kind of or restore some kind of synchronized uh, synchronized response of the cells and that would be you know, a health, healthy system it's a healthy system that we're talking about not a healthy cell <clears throat> and so this is the idea that um i'll leave you with that we can discuss Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for the for the opportunity to be able to join. Um, I have to say I was going through and looking at my slides and thinking about what I should resort after listening to, to Greg and Lisa's talk. Um, I usually spend I usually spend a little bit at the beginning trying to trying to explain the concept of entrainment and coherence, but I feel like it's been done so eloquently. There's really nothing I can add. Um, I have to say I do like the example of the Millennium Bridge because when I'm talking with folks who don't quite understand, I use the example of when we find ourselves walking down the street to lunch or walking someplace and we find that our we start to entrain against the cadence of the other person's walk. And you can see this anytime you walk down a busy street. Um, and, and I think that this idea of, of entrainment and building coherence and, sh and then being able to show using, using very classic biomarkers and other, other methodologies that have been commonly used for drugs that you can actually start to affect protein level changes um, and actually start to affect disease mechanism, disease modification. I think that's a, a, an idea that maybe outside of at least today's talk in this forum is still considered pretty novel. And so since the since the, the title that I was kind of given at the beginning or the focus of the talk was Binge to Bedside, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on later stage and I'm gonna show how we've taken um, this idea of applying the really the learnings of optogenetics. Um, our co-founders are um, Dr. Ed Boyden um, out here at MIT as well as Dr. Liwei Sai. And the company really came about with trying to take the some of the learnings from optogenetics and apply this into the space of neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease, and specifically trying to drive a, a specific type um, of frequency of activity and oscillations in the brain to see if this might actually start to, to drive changes in, in the, the etiology that's driving disease progression that we see in Alzheimer's. And so one of the things that I kind of started, I took this from uh, I took this from um, Dr. Boyden's old partner from MIT who, who co-discovered optogenetics with him, Carl Dieseroth. It's, um, it's a brilliant book if you haven't read it and you want to understand how something like optogenetic, optogenetics should really be really be changing the way we think about structure function relationship on the, in the brain. Um, he had a book that came out last year called Projections. I highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's, it was my favorite book of the year. Um, but he has a, a concept in there in a statement where he makes where he talks about electricity being the fundamental currency of the brain. Our brains have evolved to transmit, to store and to generate electrical activity. And, you know, we actually do, um, to, to Margaret's point earlier, we actually do use light and sound, but the whole reason that we do light and sound is we're trying to drive a specific electrical activity through the brain. And for us, we, um, we focus on trying to drive increased gamma activity through the brain. And so I'm going to walk through, um, walk through a little bit of, of what we do. And, um, and I will try to keep it a little bit brief because I think that I, um, I think that the the talk that's already been done around how we think about driving oscillations and driving entrainment and ultimately coherence um I, I can't really add to that so you know when we think about applying this to the world of alzheimer's it's very much a very first principles approach and this is what dr Sai did at at mit if you if you look on the left you see um, a heat map of and um, we're looking at eeg so it's electrophysiology in the brain of both a beta positive and a beta negative patients and one of the things that you see and it's been and it's known in the literature is that you see a relative decrease or absence of gamma frequency activity in in the alzheimer's in the alzheimer's patients this is replicated in the transgenic alzheimer's models that we use preclinically um, and it's it's a fairly it's a fairly known phenomenon in the space and in the formation of, of the science that actually drove the first nature publication and ultimately the company was Dr. Sai looked at this and wondered, what if we could essentially do an add back experiment? What if we could drive gamma frequency oscillations in these A beta positive patients on the bottom and start to get a brain activity that looks more like the A beta negative? Um, would that help us actually, would we see differences in what we, in the other parts of Alzheimer's pathology? 
And so one of the things that they were able to do is we now do this clinically is when we bring in a patient, we, um, we start with a baseline EEG. Um, when we provide gamma frequency oscillations, so we have a, a headset that the patient wears in our clinical studies. Um, it has, it has um, a light source embedded around the periphery of the glasses that they look through, and it has an in integrated headphone so we can provide gamma frequency stimulation, um, and we can leverage both the, the audio as well as the visual cortex, and so we can provide both light and sound. And what we see is we see very quickly, we see um, entrainment and coherence across the brain. Um, and you know, coming from, coming from a background in drug development, we, this is quite powerful. The idea of being able to see target modulation for your therapeutic intervention and see it in real time in a patient is something that, um, that everybody in the drug development world wishes they could see. And so there was this original idea of if we could start to drive gamma frequency activity um, and drive entrainment and then coherence across the brain, what would happen? And I think what some of the things that we've learned is, is this has opened up a, a completely novel space for us. Um, we now see modulating these abnormalities in neurophysiology in the brain as a novel target space for treating Alzheimer's. Um, and if you think a little bit about the history of Alzheimer's here, you know, the last, uh, the last few decades have been really focused on the right side. Um, we have multiple drug programs that are increasingly reductionist, I would argue, that have, been that have been focused on trying to mitigate or ameliorate the protein pathologies that we see in Alzheimer's progression. And really, this is distilled down to focusing on, on tau and on, on A-beta and looking at protein production and protein folding in these spaces, trying to slow down the production, slow the folding, or in the cases of um, anti-A-beta antibodies, trying to remove some of the accumulation of the A-beta that we see in the brain. And you know, it's been well accepted for, for decades now that if we can change protein pathology, that changing that protein pathology will in change the electrical activity across the brain and ultimately will affect change in outcomes. And this is the premise for all of the drug development programs that we have moving forward in Alzheimer's. But there's a couple other things that we've learned about CNS over the decades. We know that the left half of this, right, if you change electrical activity, you certainly can change outcomes. We see this with um, implantable electrodes in Parkinson's and in epilepsy. And we know if we can change localized electrical activity, we change outcomes and activity in those patients. And so what, what we really kind of discovered and what Dr. Sai's Boyden figured out was that this is actually a bi-directional relationship. And they were able to show preclinically and now clinically, if you can change the electrical activity in the brain, not only does it change function, but it actually in turn drives protein level changes. And we start to see changes in protein, protein biology and protein pathology in these patients. And so it really kind of opened the field. And we have now a very crowded, and as I said, increasingly reductionist target space looking at, at protein targets and protein pathology in, in Alzheimer's. But now we see there's a very greenfield space of trying to modulate the, the neurophysiology in the brain, knowing that that has the ability to in turn also impact some of the underlying etiology of the disease. And so this is what we've decided to try to pursue and move forward into clinical studies with the goal of developing a primary first line therapy to change disease progression in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. So just before we jump to, to humans, maybe just a quick review of some of the things that we've seen. And I apologize in advance, this is a fairly busy slide, um, but here's some of the, the preclinical work that was done. Um, and, you know, as with most Alzheimer's, we start in the transgenic models, looking at the, um, looking at the, some of the, some of the classic Alzheimer's progressions that we see in, in these models. And what we found, and this is from the, this is from the, the Nature and the Cell paper published by uh, Dr. Simon Boyden, um, with gamma frequency, with, when we build gamma frequency oscillations and we're able to drive gamma frequency activity in the Alzheimer's models, um, we see, as you'll see here in the, in the stains, we see um, recruitment and activation of microglia. The microglia have a very complex role in the brain, but one of the things that microglia do is they have a, um, have a phagocytotic activity against some of the A-beta and, uh, and the hyperphosphorylated tau. We see that very quickly with activation and, and aggregation of the A-beta. We show that correlates with reductions in the um, A-beta levels in these animals. Um, at the same time, some of, 
some of the these oscillations drive changes in both, you know, oscillatory, oscillatory proteins, oscillatory genes, and we start to see vasodilation, which we believe um, ultimately is going to drive increased lymphatic clearance in the brain. Um, and then that correlates then with reductions in levels of A-beta as well as levels of hyperphosphorylated tau. And quite interestingly, we look at the the outcomes of um, the outcomes in these models. So, looking at novel object recognition, Morris water maze, the classic tests for memory and cognition in these animals, and we find the correlation there improves with the changes that we're seeing in in the protein pathology. One other one, which was quite interesting preclinically, um, was here we're seeing the CKP25 mouse, which is once again fairly well known in the world of Alzheimer's. One of the characteristics of the CKP25 is you see a pretty aggressive um, acceleration of brain atrophy in these animals as you let the Alzheimer's progress. So here, focusing on the lateral ventricles, we see significant increase in, in the, the voids, which are the lateral, lateral ventricle volume, which means that there's a concomitant decrease in the surrounding brain. So this is how we look at the, the volumetric loss. And what was found is when we went into these animals and we did gamma frequency stimulation, we were able to actually arrest this. So we were able to prevent the, the accelerated atrophy and the volumetric loss in these, in these animals. Um, and this once again correlated with outcome improvement. So the, the brain preservation that we're driving correlates with improved in, improvement in the outcomes that we're looking for in these animals. And so we've now taken these findings and we've moved forward into clinical studies. We've now completed multiple phase two studies as uh, it was, was mentioned at the beginning in the intros. Um, we received um, breakthrough designation for a first line treatment for Alzheimer's, which we received last year. We are moving forward to a phase three clinical study um, in the US for both Alzheimer's as well as MCI, so two separate studies. And so when we move into, move into clinical, we were able to now start to repeat and start to translate some of these findings into, into, um, into patients. Sorry, I lost my cursor here. There we go. Um, so now moving into humans, right? So we now treating patients for eight weeks. Um, and as we start to treat these patients, we start to see things happen very quickly. So within eight weeks, we see significant improvements in default mode connectivity um, across the precuneous network. We start to see um, not only default mode connectivity changes, but we start to see significant changes in, in protein expression and specifically looking at changes at chemokine and cytokine expression. And so we are still working with the collaborators down at, at Emory and Georgia Tech to start to deconvolute this further. But this was for us was one of the first was one of the first validations in man that driving gamma frequency oscillations and coherence in the brain had the ability to start to really change the protein impression and the protein pathology, as well as starting to build um, synaptic connectivity across the, across the Alzheimer's brain. We then, in a separate study, looked at this treatment and we're able to corroborate this now looking at 12 weeks. So one more treatment, these patients are getting one hour of gamma frequency stimulation per day. Um, and so now when we look at Alzheimer's patients at 12 weeks, once again, we see, we've confirmed that we still see increase in default mode connectivity. Um, so here looking at the posterior, posterior cingulate connectivity, um, as well as the, the medial visual network, and we show that we're preserving um, and in improving that connectivity. But for the first time in humans, we see some, whoops, sorry, didn't, let's go back. Um, we see something quite exciting where we're actually at 12 weeks starting to be able to see the preservation brain volume. We're at 12 weeks, we're by using 3T MRI, we're able to start seeing the increased um, ventricle change. And so we're starting to see that atrophy that is expected um, in Alzheimer's progression. And you can see that when we look at the treated group, in the treated group, we're able to hold that volume the same. So we see no loss in, in brain volume, and we're already starting to see observable loss as early as 12 weeks. And so with these, with these findings in, in these earlier studies, we went through and did a blinded multicenter study looking at mild to moderate Alzheimer's patients, same treatment paradigm of one hour per day of gamma frequency stimulation. Uh, and this time took this out for six months. So they were able to, to see greater impact on outcomes. 
And so our data here, which we were able to share publicly at, um, at Alzheimer's at the ADPD conference last year, um, we were able to see a number of interesting things. So a roughly 80% improvement versus the placebo group in, um, in memory and cognition is measured by the MMSE. Um, in all of these, the treated group is in the red, just like the previous slides. The placebo group um, is in the green of the lower. We saw a roughly 80% improvement versus placebo once again in functional. So the ADCS ADL is a measure of functional activity, um, whereas the MMSC for, and I apologize for folks who may not be, um, spend a lot of time in Alzheimer's and know some of these endpoints. The MMSC um, is kind of classic cognition and memory. Um, a, way to, a good way to think about this is in the MMSC, you will have a word list that has card keys in it. Um, the ADC, ADCS ADL is a measure of function. Can you find your car keys and do you still know what to do with them, right? And so much more of a, a global functional measure. And on both of these, we see the ability to, to maintain level of function in the patients that are receiving the gamma frequency oscillation. We do not see the, the oops, sorry, did not mean that. We do not see the, the bump in cognition that then would recede as has been classically demonstrated with the seal and colon asterisk inhibitors. But what you really see is you see a, a change in the slope. And we, if you look at the, the declines here, we've taken patients with an Alzheimer's rate of decline and we've moved them to a rate of decline associated with non-pathological aging. And that's a, that is a huge win in the world of Alzheimer's, as I'm sure most of you know. But interestingly, alongside this, we also um, used MRI to be able to look at brain volume. And we were able to correlate in the groups that had the, the improvement in, in memory, as well as in functional ability. We saw the same preservation of brain volume that we were able to see in the preclinical models. Um, once again, moving patients from an Alzheimer's rate of a volumetric decline to a non-pathological aging rate of decline. Um, and for those of us who are, uh, who are greater than mid to late forties, it's unfortunate, but yes, that rate on the, that slope on the top is what we're all doing. So I'm sorry for the bad news there. But um, for us, this was quite striking, right? The ability to show significant improvement in FDA approval outcomes. Um, the FDA has since agreed with us that we will be looking at the MMSC and the ADCS ADL as our primary endpoints for approval in our pivotal study. Um, and so as we, as we kind of think about how we knit this all together, um, what, we, what we really see here is we see, a, we see kind of a, as is a prospective validation, right? We know that at T0, when we look at these patients and bring them in and we start with an EEG, we see this relative absence of gamma frequency activity um, in the patients that are, that are in the advanced MCI or Alzheimer's. Um, we, can see, we can see this coherence um, and this target modulation immediately. We can vary a little bit of the, both the frequency and the amplitude, and we can look for um, maximal coherence at T0. Um, and then because there does seem to be a little normal variation from patient to patient, which we find quite interesting. Um, as I said, as soon as eight weeks, we start to see changes in both protein expression levels, as well as starting to see default mode network changes in connectivity. Um, within just one month after that, we see those continued, and now we're starting to see changes in, in brain volume and brain atrophy between treated and untreated. And ultimately, just like in the animal models, we're able to drive this towards um, significant changes in, in, in cognitive as well as functional ability that correlate with, the, correlate with the changes that we see in volumetric preservation. So um, I will... Uh, I will wrap just a little bit to show you where we are, we're taking this. Um, so we, we do think that this is a, a novel target space and really a, a novel mechanism of action for neurodegenerative diseases. Um, we're focusing, as I said, initially on Alzheimer's, which will be our first phase three study, which we will start enrolling in the next couple months. Um, that is going to be followed by a phase, separate phase three study in MCI patients. Um, and then we've already started um, and we'll be enrolling patients in the next month in a phase two study in, in Parkinson's disease. And so in terms of the, you know, the original premise, which was Ben's bedside, I think that we've, we've spent the last, uh, last five years moving from the Alzheimer's animal models and trying to build increasing amounts of 
of data around this, this, this novel mechanistic approach to using light and sound to drive specific oscillations in the brain and have been shown that they in turn not only improve function, but help drive changes in the etiology that we see in Alzheimer's. Brent, thank you very much indeed. Uh, three fascinating, fascinating uh, uh, talks here. Um, it, we, I, I introduced the talk by saying we're talking from going from upstream to downstream, but some of the concepts we have here are actually further back upstream than most of the upstream of, of medicine today. Uh, and uh, that's where we're going to have to have some uh, catch up. It's fascinating also to see lots of pictures of murmurations of starlings. I didn't think I was going to see starling murmurations in our presentations. And mm -hmm. um, as you probably also know, the, the Romans used to break step before they went across bridges because they knew about this phenomenon as well before we managed to design a wobbly bridge 2,000 years later in London. <laughs>